Two firefighters pretend to be gay and tie the knot to make sure one of their children are entitled to health care. However, an agent sniffs that there might be something off with their make-believe marriage. And that's why today in Flick Summary, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. The film opens with our titular characters having a game of basketball, joined by a team of firemen. And that's where we meet Chuck, a womanizer macho man who does everything and anything for a little bit of action. And surprisingly, he is able to get it. During their game, one of his previous flings confronts him for sleeping with her sister on the weekend. And let's just say he's rather shameless about it. You slept with my twin sister on Saturday. That's why I'm so upset. How do you know for sure it wasn't you? Because I wasn't. There. Seconds later, the other twin sister promptly arrives and, for some reason, Chuck pressures them to kiss, which they almost end up doing, until the alarm goes off, signaling the group to put down a fire. Chuck ditches the twins and joins the firemen, promptly getting back to work. This is where we meet Larry, a widower who is only striving to take proper care of his kids. Basically, Chuck's complete opposite, but also best friend. But you know what they say. Opposites attract. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Our boy managed to put out the fire and rescue a rather complicated man as they return to the fireman premises. There, our boy Chuck asks about his quasi niece and nephews, curious to know how they're doing. Larry, however, isn't too thrilled about answering, seeing that his son, Eric, is displaying some particular behaviors. Mommy's already. Would you stop using my easy bake oven? But I like to bake. Enough with the splits! Watch baseball! Hey, it was the 2000s. Things weren't too progressive back then. Back home, Larry spent some quality time with his kids, who he is still struggling to take proper care of, seeing as he's still not too used to cooking their meals, improvising a bolognese pasta with some hamburgers meat and a tomato sauce. That sounds good. Let's give him a C for effort, yes? Anyways, Larry hopes to increase his life insurance policy in order to ensure his children's health care, scared that he might also die a premature death due to his high-risk profession. Unfortunately though, due to some legal stuff I'm not too sure about regarding his wife's passing, stops him from being able to name his kids as primary beneficiaries. Ouch. However, a loop in the system might be the answer to his prayers. Should you remarry? Your new wife at that time could be named your primary beneficiary. In short, if he gets married, his partner could be the primary beneficiary, who could then pass it down to the children. Or at least I'm guessing so. Defeated, Larry goes back to work. We cut back to the fire station as the team gets called to yet another fire, where things are a little more flamed up than the rest of them. Still, they promise each to come out the same way they came in. Alive. While Chuck is busy joking around with Larry, a chunk of the floor collapses on Chuck, but our boy Larry is quick to save his life. The pair gets rushed to the emergency room, where our womanizer doesn't waste any time on hitting on the doctor that attends him. Do you know where you are? Am I in a Motley Crew video? Because you're hot. <laughs> that guy certainly doesn't kid around, huh? Larry wakes up shortly after and Chuck thanks him to not end for having rescued his life, promising that he will do anything he asks for giving him another chance at life. Careful there, Chuck, your humanity is showing. Once they get sent home, Larry gets a brilliant idea that might turn both of their lives around. Can you see where this is going? Well, if not, Larry has a light bulb moment where he decides to ask his lifelong best friend to become his domestic partner, so Chuck can become the primary beneficiary and take care of the kids in case Larry dies. Well, that's not pessimistic at all, is it? At first, Chuck severely refuses the idea, but when Larry brings up the fact that he did in fact save his life, Chuck is convinced, as long as nobody but the court finds out about this. Our boys shake on it and boom, they're partners. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. The next day, the couple has a brief, unromantic courthouse partnership, disguised from head to toe, hoping that no one will recognize them. And before you know it, they're now domestic partners. Your partners now, fellas. Well, congratulations to the guys. I suppose. 
Some time later, Larry gets a visit from some dude named Glenn from the pension department, who gets sent to investigate the husbands to make sure nothing fishy is going on and that they are actually a couple. During his visit, he asks time and time again about any little detail he finds, including the not so small detail of the pictures of his ex-wife. That's Paula. Uh, she's my late wife. So you haven't always been gay? No, I'm, uh, I'm newly. Yay. Not too long after, Glenn finally leaves the couple be and proceeds to send in his report, refusing to reveal if it will be a positive or negative one. Well, that's just mean. Feeling paranoid, Larry schedules an appointment with a lawyer, Alex McDonough, an expert in this sort of cases, apparently. Chuck is immediately smitten with the girl but struggles to keep up the facade of the two being a legitimate couple. Alex assures the fake couple that everything will be fine if they're actually legit, but to keep an eye out if a guy named Clint Fitzer gets sent to their place as it might mean that something fishy is going on, or at least they suspect so. Well, that's just great. As it turns out, the pension department is investigating almost every couple they get due to another fake gay couple pretending to be married, so one of them could benefit from healthcare benefits. So yes, basically what they're doing. Alex suggests the couple should actually get married, so agents stop suspecting they're faking it. As you might have guessed, the two aren't too thrilled about it, but go through with it anyway. Given that gay marriage wasn't legal in the States during the 2000s, the guys have to go to Canada. The pair is quick to head their way to Canada, and while they're on a cab, they joke about their upcoming marriage, while Chuck gives Larry some advice about moving on with his life following his wife's death. She would want you to be happy, she would want you to move on with your life, find somebody new, I'm telling you. The driver decides to make some snide comments about the couple and ultimately insults them, leading the guys to get in a fight with the man for being insensitive about their apparent sexuality. After this brief confrontation, our newly couple head on to a local church to discuss what type of wedding they wish to perform. We have a bit of a dilemma when Chuck desires a Jewish wedding and Larry would much rather want to go for a Catholic one. Religious. I'm Jewish, I don't want to piss my mother off. I'm Catholic, I don't want to piss Mel Gibson off. The couple eventually decides on a civil wedding with Jewish tradition to keep a safe middle ground. Minutes later, Chuck and Larry are finally pronounced husband and husband. I now pronounce you husband and husband. You may kiss the husband. Oh, oh, they didn't see that one coming, did they? In order to keep appearances, Chuck slaps Larry and just explains that that's how they do it in their house. The two return to their home state where Chuck and Larry have decided to move in together, in case another agent decides to drop another unannounced visit. As fate might have it, while checking the mail, Larry runs into Clint Fitzer, rummaging their garbage, the agent the lawyer had told them about not too long ago. Apparently, this investigation Mr. Fitzer is running heavily depends on stereotypes and, well, Chuck and Larry's trash just isn't gay enough. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? They hop on a quick shopping trip to try and convince Clint that their trash is indeed gay. During their adventure, Chuck bumps into Alex, the lawyer from earlier, who invites him to an AIDS fundraiser costume party along with his pretend husband Larry. No matter though, he is still pumped about spending some time with the girl that has caught his eye. While at the party, Chuck, Larry, Alex and her brother Kevin have the time of their lives while they dance the night away. Chuck tries to make some subtle moves on Alex, but seeing as that would blow their cover, he doesn't do anything too drastic. Once they leave the party, a group of religious protesters crash the party entrance, where they invalidate their sexuality and threaten them with eternal damnation, striking them anytime soon. You people have like worms in your brain, honestly. Chuck gets a little offended from their outdated remarks and steps in to defend the entire party. The lead protester gets a little too offensive after calling him a slur, word which leads to Chuck throwing a punch square in his face. For your information, the accepted vernacular is gay. Almost one! Crazy people, zero! You go, Chuck! Defend those human rights! 
The following morning, the fire department hears the news of Chuck's actions at the party, which greatly upsets the boss. He tells them that he doesn't believe for a minute that they are actually sleeping together and lets them know that if the pension department gets too much on their nose for this, he will not hesitate to report the pretend couple. Are you threatening me? Instead of getting freaked out by his boss threats, Chuck decides that it's the perfect time to have a girl stay with Alex after she calls him to hang out for a little while. Ooh, ooh. Girl stay. <laughs> sure. Chuck and Alex spend the day shopping and return back to her place, where Alex orders Chuck to feel her breasts so she can prove to him that they're actually real. Well, this is a little strange, no? The following day, the firemen are having their regularly scheduled basketball match with one another. As soon as Chuck gets ready to join, the other reject him, claiming to be scared that he might get a little physical with them. Well, they suck. Alone and rejected, Chuck gets approached by the most intimidating member of the fire squad, Fred, who emotionally embraces him as he confesses that he is also gay. Me too. You too what? I'm gay. This is so sweet. Chuck and Alex spend some more time together and asks him to show what moves work on Larry to turn him on. Kind of weird question to ask, right? As Chuck shows her the moves he uses, the mood completely switches directions and Alex finally kisses him. Why did you do that? However, when she notices what she has done, she immediately stops and sends him away. To make matters worse, Clint has made another surprise visit and Larry's daughter reveals that Chuck is currently visiting that lawyer lady he talks about when he's not around. Chuck and Larry get called to rescue some dude who is stuck inside a ventilator. But while the man waits to be pulled out, the husbands have a fight about Chuck not being home when Clint showed up. Things get a little heated between the two as the man who is hanging upside down in a ventilator decides to intervene. What you guys need is a bubble bath. Shut up! Thanks for the input, buddy. Anyway, after their confrontation gets more and more intense, Larry walks away from Chuck, leaving the poor man hanging. The pair doesn't spend too much time apart from one another when their boss calls them in for a meeting, where he explains that the fire squad has requested their transfer due to their homosexuality. However, since he knows it's actually all an act, he decides to skip the transfer but puts them on separate shifts, much to their disappointment despite their current fighting status. Larry is incredibly upset at his workers and berates them for forgetting all the times they spent together and helped each other out. I am very disappointed! Once Larry gets home, he reminisces about the times he spent with his wife but realizes that it's time to move on, throwing away Paula's possessions he never had the heart to before. Chuck and Larry reconcile as he asks him to sleep on the same bed again. Can I sleep in a bed tonight? I'd like that. Not gonna lie, that's actually sort of cute. Sometime later, the couple receives a call from Alex, who demands to meet with them. Apparently, over 16 women claim to have slept with Chuck in the last year, and she's starting to question just how legit their marriage actually is. You got me. When asked, they keep up with the act, stating that they are actually gay without hesitation. Due to the woman's accusations, the couple gets called into court, where they are forced to prove that their marriage is indeed real. Much to their surprise, during their court appearance, the fire squad shows up, ready to testify in favor of the pair, realizing that they've been acting a little too mean. At court, the couple is confronted by Clint, who questions every little aspect about their marriage. Mr. Valentine, please tell us why you married Mr. Levine. Love. They get interviewed individually, where they recall their past experiences together in front of the court. Things go as smooth as butter between the two and even the firemen testify in their favor, including Fred, who acknowledges that Chuck and Larry helped him come out of the closet amongst his peers. However, Clint demands one final thing that the two certainly did not expect. He asks them to kiss. They almost go through with it until they get interrupted by their boss, who completely blows their cover. Surprisingly, he doesn't do it on out of spite and actually gives a whole speech about how they're actually incredible good people and ended up doing quite a few good deeds. They admit their wrongdoing but recognize that it was done due to a flawed system that forced them to try and find a loop. 
hence their fake marriage. Originally, the court was going to send them to jail, but when the entire house speaks up against it and demands to be sent to jail too, the court retracts their decision. Just kidding, they actually get sent to jail. However, the judge cuts them a deal. They pled guilty to falsifying a legal document, reducing their charge to misdemeanor and has them host a series of fundraiser for AIDS research, seeing as they're basically gay celebrities now, as the judge put it. Two months later, Alex's brother marries Fred in the same parish Chuck and Larry married in. At the wedding celebration, Chuck approaches Alex in hopes of making things right with her. She agrees to a dance while Larry starts conversation with another girl at the party. Well, I guess you can tell that a happy ending, huh? <laughs> I love a happy ending! <laughs> and that's all for today! Things we do for our friends, huh? Let me know in the comments what's the craziest thing you've ever done for a friend. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, like this video and share it with your friends. See you next time!